Welcome to the Inside Carolina Podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Ashley. This is On The Beat Live, sprinkled in with a little game plan. Sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Game plan, On The Beat Live, Wednesday night, day before Thanksgiving. Who? What's the worst that could happen? I've got Gregory Hall running the wheels. Joey Powell showing up, coming out of the darkness. Um, Joey, we need to get you something other than a jailhouse tan. Greg Barnes down on the bottom and special guest, Mr. Tate Frazier. Uh, Tate, I got to ask the big question. Why, why are you here tonight? I thought I was going to say, where's Titus? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a good question, too. Titus is, uh, you know, back in Los Angeles. We were back, both in New York last night calling the St. John's game, but uh, I was not able to watch North Carolina. But I'm officially hitting the panic button, guys. So I, I hit the panic button, and uh, I immediately wanted to go to see what uh, you guys had to say because – you're on the beat. You know what's actually going on. I am not naive enough to think that I know what's actually going on on the ground. So I just need some information. I need some solace. You know, I'm trying to find solace in a season where uh, we are not looking good so far. It is still early. It is. It, it's not even December yet, man. Come right. on. There's only you're six games, six Tommy. Games That's what he told us. <laughs> yeah. That's what he still early. made sure I understood that it was only six games. <laughs> Greg Barnes. Uh, lead beat writer, of course, and the man here of all this bunch. Greg, uh, the, my biggest takeaway is they won, yes, but Brady Manick was pissed after that game. Um, pardon the language, it's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, um, so it might get a little loose. But, Greg, uh, this team has some issues despite getting the win on against UNC Asheville. Yeah, for sure. And I think what we saw on Sunday is, is a concern for everybody. Um, it was interesting to, to kind of hear Hubert address it. We got uh, a little bit of commentary about how he had a very uh, intense practice on Monday, but we didn't get any uh, specifics, whether it be asking players from Hubert himself, Adam Lucas at, at Go Hills uh, wrote a column on it. And really about the only specific detail we got out of it was that Hubert you know, told the managers to t- turn the music off. Um, so what, what intense looks like to Hubert Davis, we don't know. And I think that's part of the issue is that uh, he's, he's spoken in a lot of generalities dating back to when he was hired. Uh, but if you go back to when he was hired, you know, one, one of the things that he always talked about was, you know, North Carolina is going to show up. Well, they didn't show up on Sunday. And, and I think that, that has some red flags. And I think a lot of people expected North Carolina to come out gangbusters on Tuesday against Asheville. Uh, and play uh, intense, play with a lot of energy. And we saw it for, I don't know, seven, eight, maybe 10 minutes. And then they kind of settled in and went back to what they'd been doing and allowed Asheville to get back in that game. And Asheville is not a good basketball team by any stretch. No. Uh, and yet here we are, you know, with, with 10 minutes left in the game, Asheville's within seven and had the momentum. And they, they had a couple wide open threes where they could have just shot a decent percentage from long range. You know, that could have been a very competitive game at the end. So, yes, we're just six games in. Hubert's exactly right about that. Um, but there are a lot of issues. And I think most concerning, as you mentioned, Tommy, uh, Brady, Brady was fired up. And it was very much like we've got to come together as a team. Then Hubert said that he's really going to take the next week to really work with the team off the court, which you know, screams chemistry and team unity. Uh, and all that stuff right there is, is far more important than any of the schematic stuff. Mm. Uh, so uh, as you were talking, Greg, Sherelle McMillan, um, I would say came in from the cold, but looks to be out in the cold <laughs> <laughs> on the porch in the office. Sherelle, uh, you know, Tate Frazier's here because he wants to hear what Sherelle McMillan has to say <laughs> about Carolina's struggles. Um, granted, just six games in. What have you seen so far, specifically in the last three? <laughs> so I'm sick, so I apologize. Uh, and then y'all got me sitting out in the cold and asked a book <laughs> for hazard pay. Um, nah, man, my, my biggest thing is, like, where's the joy? You know, like, where's the fun? It looks... Uh, our guy Mike Tate knows him. Mike Hardison was like, it looks transactional. And that's that's what you see on the court. I don't see a lot of, hey, this is a game we all grew up loving, you know, out there on the court. It looks taxing. It looks um, like their feet are kind of stuck in the mud. 
Uh, so I just, that's my question. Like, are, are you having fun? And if, if not, why? And then the other thing is like, Hubert Davis's entire platform is built on, hey, this place is special. You should come out with your hair on fire, you know, um, playing great defense and just going all crazy because you get to wear that North Carolina jersey. And right now, that is not coming out at all. And I don't think it's necessarily a Hubert thing because these issues predate him. I mean, this is something that has been talked about for the last couple of years. It's kind of like Roy Williams just confounded that he had to teach effort or coach effort. So I don't know what it is, but Hubert, I, I, I think it's easy to be like, oh, it's a new coach, <clears throat> you know, cis games, and he's struggling, which, you know, maybe he is. We, we can't really tell. But what we can tell is that some of the things that has plagued this program and this particular team and some of these guys are is still there. Um, and it's been there for three years now. That is a, that's what's interesting to me. And we talk about in football a lot about a cultural issue um, and new coaches have to, to set a new culture. And But you're right, Sherelle. And here's what I want to do. I'm going to go to Joey and then I'm going to go to Gregory. And then I want to get the 30,000 foot view from you, Tate. Um, but Carolina has had these issues for two or three years. It's nothing new. One thing, and, and Joey, I'll ask you this. One thing that Roy Williams would do is if you were on the court, and you were slacking or not playing hard, you would go to the bench and you would sit and watch somebody else for some period of time. Hubert Davis hadn't done that. I mean, he's playing, what did we say last week, Greg? There's seven guys that are playing 20 plus minutes and nobody else is playing more than 10. Yeah. Joey, Joey, you were there in person last night um, along with uh, tens of your favorite, of your best friends, it appeared, in the Smith Center. What'd you see from a, a up close perspective that maybe television or even from press row couldn't see? Yeah, so I want to give a shout out to Brian Evans in the YouTube chat. I mean, he said the same thing I've said in a couple of Coast to Coast podcasts earlier this year with Sherelle and Sean that if this team can ever be greater than the sum of its parts, look out. Right now, I don't even know that it's that the sum of its parts are decent. And to your point about the rotation, I don't know whether Hubert Davis just doesn't feel like he has the standing to bench guys I don't know whether it's promises that were made to guys who came into the program I don't know whether it's just different attitudes can't tolerate being benched it's probably a combination of all of these but I absolutely think that it's it's painful to watch I love the com the comment that Sherelle made about it being transactional like I'm sitting there watching last night and it reminds me of if you guys remember any time you were in a group project in undergrad where you got stuck with a bunch of randoms to do this, you know, semester weighted grade project with people that, you know, you're in a class with, but otherwise you probably don't have a ton in common with. That's what it looks like. It looks like everybody's got to put this project together. Like, all right, let's go play this 40 minutes. Um, even in, and, and I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the, the full, you know, message board analysis guy that says well they don't look happy or he frowns too much but I mean even watching these guys in warm-ups they don't look like they're I don't know and they don't have to be chummy they don't have to be friends but they just don't look like they want to be there and it's hard I think for a lot of Carolina fans it, at least it's hard for me as an observer to see that and, and not say what the hell is going on so to your point I don't know how I don't know how Hubert Davis can fix it I mean, when you talk about turning off the music in practice, like the 80s wrestling fan in me pictures Ravishing Rick Rude coming out saying, cut the music, and then him, like, you know, gyrating in front of the camera. I don't think Hubert Davis did something like that, but I absolutely don't know what turning the music off is going to do to make these guys enjoy basketball anymore. And maybe that's the, the tease that you guys gave Greg about uh, he's going to spend some more time with these guys this week. Maybe that's what he's talking about and trying to get them to – to be more enjoyable but it just look all eight of the guys that play right now look like they're absolutely like one step away from having a you know root canal and it just it's it's hard to understand and I don't know how fans can be expected to get behind that when the guys don't look like they're having any fun yeah and Joey I'll add this you know, the preseason tournament or the early season tournament this year was, was short it was just the weekend but this is the time period over however many years where Roy Williams used this period as a time for the guys to, to kind of gel and get together. And they would spend an extra day or two, whether it be in Maui or Vegas or wherever, 
and just kind of you know, screw around, just be kids. And coming out of that, you typically got some pretty good feelings about, hey, you know what, we have a better understanding of each other. We, we had a good time. You know, if you go back to when uh, Will Graves played on the team and they went to the Bahamas, he talked about you know, jumping off uh, some of the slides at the Atlantis and how it made him really like love the guys. And it was like, a really cheesy comment, but you got it. And granted, we haven't been able to sit down with the guys in a, in a face-to-face situation, but we have just not gotten any of those vibes whatsoever. And watching last night, right, I wrote about this after the game, 18-3 to against Loyola, then you're, you outscore them by one the rest of the game, and that was the first five minutes they were up 18-3. Yesterday, 14 minutes in the game, you're up 35-15, to you let Asheville go on a 23-10 to run, and then you get outscored by one point the remainder 25 minutes of the game, right? So it's not like it's a battle like it's Brown, like it was against Brown the whole 40 minutes, right? They're they're better than these teams, and then they're just like, all right, we're better than these teams, and then they just stop playing. They didn't necessarily always stop playing on defense last night. Yes, they left up some open shooters, but you could tell they were a little bit more wheels turning on the defensive side of the ball than maybe, say, against Tennessee. But, I mean, Brady said it, right? They just Offense wasn't there. There was a lot of stagnant movement, but it's not like there was stagnant movement for the full 40 minutes. I looked over, Greg, to you last night, and it was just like, all right, they're they're moving off ball a lot more. They're actually running the offense that they ran against Purdue That we when we talked about, man, this team has a lot of fight. And that was five days. That was three days before they played – Asheville last night so maybe it was a lull they were I don't you don't we don't really know um but I mean that's just what I saw as far as look you're beating a team by 20 in the first 15 minutes of a game that's exactly what you should be doing why did you get outscored by one the rest of the way it just doesn't it doesn't add up it doesn't make sense based on the talent that everyone knows is on this team um and Brady said the four McDonald's All-Americans comment last night it doesn't necessarily always work like that we know but the sentiment and the thought is correct. This is a talented team, and we all talked about it in shows before this, and we'll all talk about it in shows after this. But it just it doesn't make sense how you're getting outscored by one on your home court to a UNC Asheville team that lost by 30 to Chattanooga. Not just getting outscored, getting outplayed. I mean, oh, they they thing. wanted they tried more. They wanted it more yeah. on the road in the Dean Dome against the team that just got. Their butts, their butts handed to them two days before in Tennessee. That shouldn't happen. You mentioned the difference in Purdue and Asheville. The difference in Purdue and Tennessee game was ridiculous as far as that. One thing, and Tate, I want you to come in, but I've been wanting to get this out. I saw, and I think it was against Tennessee or it was against Purdue, there's a, a, a run out. Garcia is 20 feet ahead of everybody. Yeah. Caleb's got a, got the ball. And rather than give it up to Garcia, Caleb goes in and dunks it. I saw that, and from a personal standpoint, if I'm if I'm a guy like Garcia, if that's Tommy Ashley running back instead of Garcia, I'd have been barking the entire way back. That's, that's just basic basketball, man. That's just sharing the ball. Take your your take from, uh, you know, maybe a national take. It first, does anybody even care? Yeah, I was going to say, like, the the, the 30,000-foot view of North Carolina basketball is that we are irrelevant, right? I mean, that is that is really the, the only conversation that anyone is having about North Carolina is, one, why didn't they hire Wes Miller, which I didn't know that this was such a thing that all these pundits knew that Wes Miller was the guy. So, apparently, everyone knew, but everyone in North Carolina, that Wes Miller was somehow the genius. So, kudos to those guys for getting ahead of it. But the conversation is just that and – how do you get blown out by Tennessee, right? Those are the those are the two talking points if you talk about North Carolina. Hubert has become secondary, and the worst thing that I think that's happening right now is I love Hubert Davis, but when he goes to these press conferences and he says things like, "I still think we can win a national championship," what is he talking about, right? Like what what like I I, I like I like positivity, I like optimism, I like a belief in, in where we want to be as a program, but this team. They just got beat and stomped out by a Sweet 16 team in Tennessee. It's not on a path to a national title. And I know that that's where we want to be and that's where we hope to be, but we have to be realistic in some sense. And that was why Brady Mannix postgame, I, I, I didn't watch the game last night. I was, I was calling the St. John's game, as I said, but I watched the postgame. And I watched Hubert's postgame, 
And again, Hubert knows what to say, right? He, he has the right answers, you know. But as Greg mentioned, they're, they're kind of generalities, right? I, I read that Adam Lucas piece where the main thing that he did was turn off the player's music. And I was thinking to myself, I, I thought it was going to be like maybe the guys put on Timberland boots and ran the Dean Smith Center. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, like that was what I thought was going to be the, the jerky moment. Not that we I turned your music off, right? And so you add all that together, and then Brady Manning comes and says, we played a good defensive game, but we weren't able to put a whole game together. We haven't been able to put a whole game together. Hubert says the same thing. We haven't put a whole game together. So, so what is like what, what is the disconnect between those two things? How do we get a full game? And you know, I see Maui in my mind. I see the whole team on the catamaran. I, I see the, them smiling. I see them jumping into the ocean. I, like, should they go on a whitewater rafting trip? Should we take something from Tony Bennett? Like, it, these are the things that I'm like. It, it seems like team building, right? And, and trying to get yeah, get these guys to mesh together in some capacity is the real thing. And I, I don't necessarily think it's a Hubert Davis problem as the national media, like I said, is pointing it to. I, I think it's these players, this team, this group buying in and it takes some selflessness. And and Hubert said it wasn't selfishness, it was carelessness uh with the turnovers. I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think there is some selfishness. I think there's also some carelessness. And at the end of the day it's not Carolina basketball. And I think, you know, if you've watched Carolina basketball like we all have for so many years you know when Dawson Garcia is up ahead and has a runaway dunk, you make that pass. And then he dunks it, and then he looks at Caleb and points the passer, and we all go, hey, that's Carolina basketball. But that's what I expect. But right now, we we, uh, we are not playing that way. To say you, the you mentioned the carelessness. There was the one turnover that Caleb had, and Asheville had just forced a turnover in the full-court press. Caleb got the ball and then just kind of just, like, handed – like just kind of let go of the ball and it went right into the hands of the Asheville player. I don't think Asheville ended up scoring off of it, but it was still, you had the ball, you caught it off the inbounds. They had just forced a turnover and you're just kind of letting go of the ball, trying to pass it to your guy. And that it just fell in the Asheville player's lap. It didn't, didn't make any sense to me. So a couple things, I think the COVID situation has a ton to do with guys being able to bond. And and because mm. for two years these guys hadn't. I think that's a good uh, point. Yeah. I don't think they. And correct me if I'm wrong, but last year they played games together, but they did not hang out together. And except when it was on video, that one instance when they were all partying and having fun. <laughs> but that's a national thing. That's probably an every team thing. But every team's not having the issues Carolina has. So therefore, that's not the only issue. And then I also think having three new guys. But Sherelle. The question I want to ask you about it, and Greg, I want your thoughts on this as well, is we talked in the preseason about having a leader on the court. And, Sherelle, if I recall, you you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, something to the effect that maybe they don't need one. Maybe Hubert for the first couple of years could be that guy. And I, I love you, but I didn't really agree with that then, and I definitely don't agree with it now. I think the leader should be somebody like Brady Manick, but I don't know how that would fly given that he's been there for three months. Um, so what say with you, Sorrell, about all of that, the lack of cohesion, but also the lack of leadership that it appears that it's not coming from the players? Well, you know, I think teams are a reflection of their head coach, and their head coach has said that everybody on the team is a leader. He said that multiple times when I think it was Gre Gregor Gregory asked him, and that was the response. So I think you're hearing from him that necessarily, you know, you don't need, they don't need an individual leader. So I think that message is filtered down and they feel like they can, you know, kind of lead by committee, I guess. So um, that's where that's at. And I, I still don't think you need a traditional leader, so to speak. My, my mind won't change on that. It hasn't changed on that. Uh, I think the issues that they're having right now are a combination of a new coach, a new system, you know, three new guys who are trying to integrate. And then everybody has their um, individual um, desires and dreams. And it is a tough pill to try to mix all that together and make it form a cohesive unit. We talked about this a ton on, you know, throughout the season that Hebert Davis's biggest challenge, I think this year wasn't going to be X's and O's, although the defense has proven maybe otherwise, but it was going to be chemistry. How do you handle it when a parent calls? How do you handle it when a guy says, I'm not getting enough shots or I want to be more involved? Or how do you handle it when 
someone complains about their minutes. That's the kind of stuff that is really behind the scenes. And I think difficult for people who haven't sat in the head coach's chair before to really um, deal with. So I think that's what's going on now. Not necessarily that guys are calling and complaining and that they don't like Hubert Davis or anything like that. Mostly that um, he's having to deal with everything, you know, with, with all that mixed together. And then there's the finality of it too. Again, this team is going to look so much different next year because guys have, again, hopes and aspirations of, of what they want to do in the future. So um, I think when you mix all that together, there can be some chemistry issues. Now, it can be solved. Again, we are in game six, and I don't want to pile on any one particular player. Um, it can change, but it's going to take the entire team working together to change it. Yeah, I think we have a oh, – no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I just you're talking about like all these guys that are going to be you know leaving soon. You know, I talked to an NBA scout who was there at Hall of Fame weekend, and he told me that Carolina had one NBA player on their team. Yeah, I, and the thing so, is, so, so where so where are these guys going? Oh, that's my, it, I, that's you know, I that I you know I that's you have to ask them, I guess, Tate. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, no, 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 I, I hear you. I so you know we're we have a weekly scoop that'll be probably next week. And I asked someone a similar question who works in the NBA front office, and he was like, none. He was like, maybe a G League contract or two um, at this point. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, I would, I would say none. So I, I get that. But the mindset of those guys is, okay, this is my year. I need to get it. You know, I need to get out. Maybe, maybe I'm here a year longer than I wanted to be, or um, maybe this is the year that I can finally go. And it's just – it's hard to mix all that together. And I think that's where Royal Williams had come become kind of a, a Jedi master at getting guys to, to buy in and getting guys to um, do, as Jawad said, and, and Dewey said, the awards and rewards, you know, that mm-hmm. entire um, methodology of coaching uh, worked for him for a long time. And he was really, really good at it. And you just don't become that overnight. You know, that's the thing. He has been a head coach for six games. It, it takes a while. And, I think as the years go on, I think he'll improve in that. But is it was going to be hard this year, just because of a variety of factors all missing together. Yeah. Tate, your NBA scout comment uh, is a good segue for where I want to go. But a lot of people have brought up when Roy Williams first came back to North Carolina, which I don't think is an appropriate parallel because we knew what he was at Kansas. But after his first year back in Chapel Hill in 03 or 04, after Carolina lost, uh, what was it the Colorado in the second round? A reporter asked him, you know, who do you think is going to leave? What was his comment? You remember? Where are they going to go? <laughs> Where are they going to go? Yeah. Uh, and the same situation here. I think the difference is, is that Roy Williams can make that comment. And while it kind of flew up on some people, it was the truth. I think North Carolina right now, more than anything, has a messaging problem. The reason I say that, Hubert Davis has coached six games ever, and yet he's at one of the top five programs in the country. This was always going to be a process. This is not a, hey, he's going to coach for two months and everything's going to be perfect. Never going to happen. A lot of people thought that was going to be the case. It was not ever going to happen. It's too difficult of a job to learn on the job. But yet, it hasn't been shared that way. You know, Hubert Davis... He elected not to sit down with uh, the local media beat this offseason. Everybody asked him for interviews. We never got them. And that's everybody. But, you know, that's the NNO, uh, Tar Hill Illustrated, us. He just didn't want to do it. He wanted to focus on recruiting. Now, he did national interviews, right? Fine. You, what, however he wants to do it. We didn't have the opportunity to ask him a lot of these questions about how are you going to handle these situations when this stuff pops up? And all we've really gotten from him is that he has, you know, like he said the other night, he still thinks this team can be a national championship team. He still thinks Dawson Garcia uh, you know, is probably the best defensive big man in the country. Uh, Brady Manick may be the best outside shooting big man in the country. That may be true. But we've heard a lot of these things without getting the specifics of what's going on. I think a much better approach has been like, hey, guys, look, Roy Williams wanted Hubert Davis to follow him. We're going to let Roy Williams have his moment. I mean, he's got great influence. He's done a lot of great things for the program. He comes in, uh, kind of says, look, this is who I want to follow. This is who I think is a, a great next option for the program. But with that comes a very difficult period 
Well, he's got to get used to the job. And so during that process, you have the conversations. Hey, I'm going to be very forthcoming with, with the media. And the reason I'm doing that is because the North Carolina fan base is very intelligent. The North Carolina fan base travels very well. The reason why is you did go back to Frank McGuire back in the 50s and even before then. A lot of hardcore fans from back then, they teach their kids about it. They teach their kids about it. It's a generational thing. I have covered North Carolina basketball all over this country for a very long time. And everywhere I go, guess what? North Carolina fans show up. It is a passionate fan base. They understand basketball. They know what Carolina basketball looks like. So be upfront with them. Be honest with them. Say, look, this is going to be a, an ordeal. We're just going to have to work through it. But I am the person for this program. These are some of the issues we're dealing with. We're going to have to get through them. It's going to be a rough patch here or there. But this is where we're going. This is how we're going to get there. We just have not gotten any of that. And so what's left is we get all these generalities, all these, you know, asking specifically what he needed to fix on defense after that Tennessee game. And he said, well, we just need to fix everything. Okay, but that doesn't really tell us anything. Um, and so I, I think more than anything, it's a messaging issue. My God. Look, he, he is, he's enraged, Greg Barnes. I mean, that was, that was, as, that was as fired up as I've ever seen I'm Greg in my entire life. And I'm ready to pass the hat and sing, <laughs> sing amen in the background. Happy oh, Thanksgiving, man. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not lying. I and mean, we're thankful it, for, like. <laughs> why, we'll have positivity pod in a little bit. Uh, why, Joey, I want you to chime in here, but why does Carolina, with a nationally a world-renowned journalism school, right there in Chapel Hill, have such a bad problem with messaging. I don't get it. Go ahead, Joey. So, no, no, this, I, I appreciate that. And I kind of want to, I want to kind of follow Greg a little bit from a sense. You better bring it because Greg but, brought it. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm, I'm absolutely not going, like, I'm not going to take the choir into an A and B selection here. This is, this is, uh, this is the minute for mission. This is the old lady coming up that wants to talk about the, the second deacon board after the preacher just finished his message. So uh, I know my place, but I, I agree with everything Greg just said, and, and I think one of the things that we got used to uh, being around this program and the fans got used to was how much Roy Williams sandbagged his teams, right? I, I think, you know, the last year we saw that he wasn't sandbagging anymore, but I think one of the things Roy used to do was he would sandbag how good they were going to be to help take some of this pressure off his guys. And to your point, Greg, when you combine that with the fact that Hubert Davis has not sandbagged at all, um, and the fact that we haven't had that message come out from uh, from the central of, of the basketball office about this being a process and this being about this being a journey and this being uh, something that takes time to make the pieces fit and make the pieces perform at a high level, uh, that's when you end up having a fan base that's just kind of sitting there scratching their heads and uh, you know wondering why aren't why aren't the Tar Heels already in the top five? You know, why aren't the Tar Heels blowing everybody out by 70? Um, that disconnect can be fixed. The disconnect on the court, I think, is a little harder process. But to your point, Greg, I, th I think that's spot on. You know, there, there should have been a little better handling of the message. And to Tommy's point, when you've got the, the School of Journalism turning out, you know, amazing, amazing uh, capturers of content, producers of content, it doesn't really pleasure. make a ton of sense. I, I, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna give Tate that. I wasn't gonna give Tate that stroke. But since he's here, uh, since he's since he showed up to Drake on our track a little bit, you know, let's. I guess we could show him a a little bit of love. Well, Do you remember? I, sorry, Tate. Go no, ahead. I, no, I was gonna. I was gonna pick up off that, Joey. I, the only thing I would say, and BJ Armstrong, he, this is a great. I asked him like, how do you deal with this generation of players? Right. He he's a player agent. He's got Derrick Rose. He's got Josh Jackson. That, that's the youngest guy he has. And I said, how do you, how would you deal with like a, a, this Carolina team? You got four All Americans, and he said it's a, it's a simple question that you can ask these guys. Do you want me to tell you the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to tell you the truth? Do you want, do you want the truth? Because I like truth telling, right? Like Hubert Davis <laughs> knows the truth. He knows deep down they are not a national title team. So yeah. let's tell them the truth, right? Let, let's let's tell these guys who we are right now, and let's hope that that information will inform them moving forward and, and it will lead to better days. And, and, and I think Garcia is not the best post defensive player in America. <laughs> Thank you. Tell me the truth. Don't, 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 don't hype me up and, and try to get me on draft express. Just tell me the truth. 
And I think if you tell me the truth, we're all doing each other a favor. And I know Hubert's doing it to, to pump up his players, and I appreciate that. But hopefully behind closed doors, if, he, if he's giving the media something and we're hearing the, the positivity, I'm fine with that. As long as there's a separate conversation that's happening on the other side where the truth is being told. And as long as the yeah. truth is being told, I think I think we're moving in the right direction. And Hubert can do that. I really do believe that Hubert can be that guy. I don't think it's going to be turning off the music, but I think that he can get their attention. But uh, it, like like Greg said, it's going to take time. We're six games in. He doesn't have the cachet of a Roy Williams to say where are these guys going to go. He he's got to find who he is and his voice with this group. And they're not a tough cookie to crack. I mean, Sherelle, I mean, we all know. I mean. There's a lot of personalities within this group that are all individually talented, but they have to come together and play team basketball. And what has North Carolina taught us over the years? If you play team basketball, Kendall Marshall can be a lottery pick. If you play team, team basketball, Sean May can be a lottery pick, right? Like th There is a formula that has always worked, and we've seen it work. And it, it, does, it seems like there's something lost in translation. And, and I'll stop I off myself. Do you remember oh, the you, you flag with that? Let me throw this out, and I'll, and I'll shut up. Uh, but – if I remember correctly, and Tommy, Greg, Gregory, Shrill, Dean Smith was a master at that too. Like he would say one thing to the media and then something else to his players. Not necessarily he mm -hmm. was telling the media anything false, but the messaging can be different for different audiences. Uh, and I, yeah. I, I, I would, I absolutely agree with Tate. I would, I would hope that that's kind of a thing. Now maybe he's saying the things about Dawson Garcia as as a defender, kind of like to subliminally get. Dawson to step up his perimeter or his, his post defense game. I don't know, but I feel like Dean Smith was really good at that. And I, I would hope that maybe that's what Hubert Davis is doing. Do you remember the flack that Roy got for calling his team the least gifted team he's ever coached? Right? Yeah, what, so, what was that, last year, too? Or two two years seasons ago. ago. Yeah. It was the Cole Anthony's Cole hurt year. <clears throat> and he had Cole Anthony on that team. Cole Anthony wasn't playing, but still, and I get that year did not go well, but so I, I think they're. I, in my opinion, that's both sides of the spectrum. There's that, which is honest, and people didn't like it. Some people liked it. I appreciated it. I didn't like when ESPN took the first four graphs of my story, but I appreciated Roy's comments saying that on the radio show and actually being honest about his team and appraising them and whatnot. And then there's the other side, which, Tay, like you were saying, Hubert still saying that he thinks his team could be a national championship team and that they're still on track. You can say in, that they're still a national championship team and think they can get there. I think that's different than saying they're still on track based on the last 80 minutes of basketball we've watched. Yeah, so here's the other thing. Like with Roy, I always go back to the 08 and 09 teams uh, because it was such a sharp divide. Like he would talk about, you know, whenever Tyler Hens wrote – uh, leaves someday. I'm going to walk and climb at the top of the Dean Smith Center and just sit and reflect. Always praise Tyler. Mm -hmm. You know somebody he never praised? Danny Green. Yep. Never. Now the reason why is because if Danny heard something positive that it got into his head, <laughs> he was going to live it up, right? Mm -hmm. Hansbro didn't care what anybody said about him. In the same way, Marcus Page. There's a very select few individuals that Roy would overtly praise Kendall Marshall, Marcus Page, Joel Berry to an extent, Hansbro. Uh, but most, yeah, <laughs> most everybody else, he was a little bit uh, less forthcoming, more critical. And this gets back to so, some of the, the messaging issue. And I, I want to I mention this because it came up in, in Adam's uh, column that he did, which I thought was a good one. Um, but before the game, Hubert talked to Tar Heel Sports Network. And it's one thing to say Dawson Garcia is the best defensive big in the country. Fine. It, it doesn't hurt anybody if it's not true. As Tate said, it serves to really pump him up. And if there's any benefit in that, have at it. We all know it. Yeah, you know, whatever. He's kind of blowing smoke. But if it helps, it helps. I think you can get in trouble doing it too. And he, he gave a quote to Jones Angel, and I'm going to read it here. Uh, he was asked about you know, how the last 48 hours had gone. This is following the Tennessee game. I said, I'm ready to play tonight. I told the team yesterday at practice, I will never coach another game here at Carolina. I will never coach a team absent of my personality. The energy, the effort, the will, the want to, the response. After a game that we played against Purdue the day before, and to come out with a lack of intensity, a toughness, a desire to play for the name on the front of the jersey. I was very disappointed 
and it will never happen again. Sounds like an ultimatum to me. Those things will uh, get, you, get, get you hung up, Greg. Good point. Right? So what happens when, let's just say, North Carolina goes to Boston on New Year's Day for a noon tip at Conti Forum with 17 people in the crowd? What if the guys just aren't feeling it that day? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to be there. I can assure you I'm not going to be feeling it. Um, but by saying that it will never happen again, you're backing yourself into a corner. Because you're making the, the room smaller for yourself. Correct. Because the follow-up is, and as this is Parenting 101, anybody that's had kids or wants to have kids, the follow-up is, or what? You better be prepared to turn that car around on vacation. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely right. But didn't it happen like 30 minutes later against UNC Asheville? Right. I mean, Gregory and I are literally watching the game, and Gregory looks at me and goes, uh, Roy put in blue still right now. Yeah, he would. When Caleb did um, that turnover, he's, his butt is on that bench, and he's not seeing in, right. at least the next two TV timeouts. Right. So, again, this, this is another example of kind of the messaging uh, it is a little bit of a problem here early in the season. I think um, – let me add this. We keep talking about where they're going to go. Um, the world has changed. It's a college basketball, as we all know, is much different. So – They'll go to Memphis. They'll go to Georgia. They'll go to Syracuse. They'll go to UCLA. They'll go to USC, wherever, Minnesota. Um, except, for, except for you would assume McCoy and Garcia, considering they've used their one-time transfer uh, without sitting out. So it, you have to be leery of that. Weary, wary, weary. I get weary and weary so confused all the time. Which one is it? Wary or weary? Oh, Somebody tell whatever me. you want, girl. If you're wary of something, you're like worried about it. You're like yeah, skeptical. If you're weary, yeah. you're just tired. You're okay. Tired. Well, I'm I'm both. I'm skeptical and tired <laughs> of the transfer portal. No, because it's changed things, and it's 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 not bad overall. I think it, it's it's good for the players to have that freedom, considering the coaches have it. But it it does hang over roster management. It hangs over the the coaches a ton because you see it now, and you're like, hmm, that guy only played seven minutes. I wonder if he's thinking about entering the portal. You know, that's, that's the first thought. It's not, okay, well, if he works hard over the summer and becomes a better player, he'll get minutes next year. It's, mm, is he going to leave? So um, I think that is part of what we've been talking about for the last several months, the sense of urgency that I think Hero Davis has with this particular team because it is not going to look anything like this next year because guys are going to leave. They could transfer. They could, you know, try their pro options. But this is not – this is not um, his – his team that he's going to build over the next couple of years. I think we'll start seeing that in two to three years, but this is a kind of a one-year deal. And I think everybody it's knows that. You've used it, the word yeah. bridge on Coast to Coast Trail. That's it's a yeah. bridge. I love that word. And I think that's why there's some of this pressure and there's some of this angst. And maybe that's why there's some of this lack of joy because everybody knows this is the end. Well, Sherelle, let me ask you this on, on in that regard, if the team's going to look completely different than it is next year, and your top seven that are all playing right now, unless I'm missing somebody, I guess maybe R.J. Davis, is, they're all going to be gone next year. Wouldn't it behoove you to get eight through 12 some time on the court since those guys could possibly be back next year? Not as a first-year head coach, I don't think. As a first-year head coach, you need to win. You need to, you need to put the stamp on the program. You need to show what you can do. And – I think when you when you go out and add a, a Brady Manic and a Dawson Garcia, and I said it at the time, I don't, I'm not trying to be revisionist or anything, but when you do that, you kind of wipe away any, oh, it's the first year head coach and he's got to worry about this when it comes to on the court stuff. Because again, I don't care what anybody says, you're not going to find four or five, six more teams more talented than North Carolina, you know, one through 10. I, I believe that. And nobody's going to change my mind on that. The issue is, Excuse me. Again, I told you I got it. I'm sick and I have a cold. This is bad radio. Do you have COVID? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm, I need to take a test before Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah, the issue is, is that there's a lot of mouths to feed. There's one ball. And are, are you okay not getting your shots? Are you okay being a glue guy? Are you okay being a defensive specialist? And if you're not, and you have other aspirations, then that's going to cause issues. I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's about any particular player. I don't even think it's really bad. It's just a reality. 
I think I said something in the podcast about how Hubert was pre- – there was pressure on Hubert to win now and win immediately. Because if you, if you look at the roster next year, it, it's not going to be as talented. Regardless of who they bring in, it's just not going to be as talented. It could be more cohesive, and therefore it could be better, but it's not going to be more talented. But can't right, you right. do – And the PR hit of the transfer portal would be – I mean, let, let's say – like Gregory's point, right? You and Gregory at the game. Let's say that Hubert pulls our, our starting point guard, puts him on the bench, and puts in Blue Steel. And then we wake up Wednesday morning, and you know that person has put his name in the transfer portal. And now that's national news, and that's everywhere, and that's the Hubert day. Like that, that is like what I under. If, if that was, if you were, if we're talking about being truth teller. If you were, you know, behind the scenes or, or anything was like, I'm, I'm scared of that fallout, and that's part of his rationale i would understand that because like sherelle said it's a different world that we live in you've got coaches recruiting players on other teams that play less than 10 minutes right so the guy's playing less than 10 minutes and he's a four or five star guy he's got some coach somebody reaching out to him in some capacity to try to talk to him to, to give him more opportunity so that fear is always on the other side of of coaching decisions and that i think is the, the biggest difference in what college basketball is and also, these, these coaches aren't afraid. Like, John Calipari was recruiting the Illinois coaching staff and the Iowa's team in the tournament. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, when, when have we ever <laughs> seen this? I mean, and, that, and that's kind of the world that we're in. And so I understand that fear from Hubert's side. But maybe at some point you have to show that, you know, I'll turn the car around. To, to put it back to the parent, like, I, I will turn this car around and I'll deal with the, the, the repercussions of that decision. So At a certain point, I, you have to yeah. coach. Like you, like if something's not working and the same thing is happening over and over again, like the turnovers, then either you, if you're not gonna bench, then call a timeout and talk to your team, right? Or bench, talk to the player on the sideline, and then get him right back in the game, right? That's that's where I'm at as far as at a certain point something needs to happen other than just letting players make the same mistakes or not play more guys something it's it's gotta it can't be if that fear is real and if that's the case at a certain point though you just have to coach because you can't tell me that putting in don trust styles and demarco dunn last night for more minutes would give you a worse result than what happened you can't tell me that How, how many kids like the top 100 want to go to charlottesville virginia and work on defense for you ninety percent of every practice under Tony Bennett. Zero. Can't be many, right? So uh, what he has to do is he has to say, "This is how my program is going to be built. This is what matters to me," and then go recruit to that level. Now, in the meantime, if that means you've got to run guys off, so be it. It goes back to the messaging thing. You just tell the fans, "Look, we are doing this. We're building this program this way." And if these guys don't want to be part of it, that's fine. They can go and, and find whatever they want elsewhere. That's not a problem. No hard feelings. Like, it's no hard feeling. That's the other thing. You can get a, you can get ahead of that and say, I want him to do great. We saw it the other night. Tony Bennett plays Georgia. He's playing one of his old guys that transferred to Georgia, and all he did was talk about how great he was, even though he had a horrible game. You Mac Brown I mean? does but, it. Right. Mac Brown's yeah, done Mac it Brown this year. It. Yes. All right, Joey, you got to bounce. I'm out. I hope to. I hope everybody who's on tonight uh, appreciate it. Good seeing you guys. Join Gregory and some of Tommy and some of Greg Barnes for the uh, Inside Carolina Live pregame show coming to you at four o'clock on uh, Chapelboro.com, WCHL here locally. But uh, y'all boys do good. Get some trip to Fan Indy tomorrow and uh, be thankful for what you got. It's good to see you, everybody. Yeah, yeah likewise, Joey. Joey. See y'all. Hi, to Joey. All right. So while Joey dips out, let's let's answer some of these questions. And and this is on the beat um, live game plan podcast coming up in a minute. If we can get Jason Staples in here, Tate Frazier, Greg Barnes, Sherelle McMillan, um, a wounded Sherelle McMillan. Um, you know, you play you play hurt. I mean, you just play through it. And Sherelle's doing that. Yeah, it's yeah right. So I guess we're all Scotty Pippen, and uh, you know. Rails ruining the league and destroying this <laughs> podcast, being sick and scoring 45. Uh, Gregory Hall is running the wheels. Let's talk about these questions. Let's go here. Um, Greg, let me ask you a question. Why not play the two freshmen when it's not that big a drop off in talent? I mean, we've kind of hit on it, and I, I tend to agree with it. Um, it's just not Roy Williams basketball anymore. Carolina fans need to realize that and get over it, but still. 
you yeah, can't I'm, go seven deep all year and expect something catastrophic not to happen. Well, we talked to talk to Hubert. I asked him about his rotations before the trip to Connecticut. And he was up front saying, I want to play more guys. I want to play Anthony Harris four minutes. Uh, and Anthony Harris has played a little bit more. And I, I think if you look at the, the minute distribution against Asheville, there was a little bit better separation. Um, you, you did see, I think there were seven guys in double digit minutes, maybe eight guys. Uh, it wasn't a drastic change, but it was a little bit of a uh, expanded roster. Um, I mean, Huber says he wants to do it. Now, the issue is North Carolina had really seven cupcakes in the non-conference schedule. They've already played four of them. So you're kind of running out of time if you want to use those opportunities. But um, he, he is on record as saying that he wants to use his bench a little bit more. It just really hasn't happened quite yet. So the, the, it sounds kind of like Mac Brown, right? Mac says yeah, we want to get sure. these guys times, but we're just not getting times in. Sherelle, the question was why not play the freshman? Why not um, get them some minutes? And, and we've kind of gone over it. Uh, we've talked about the leader. Somebody asked why is Brady Manick not starting – I, I'm not sure I understand that one, um, or maybe I do. Well, he uh, said he said that he thinks Garcia is, is a really good defensive big, and I, I, it probably is nothing more than that, honestly. Um, judging from when Baycott goes out, and when, even when Baycott's out there, um, I would probably strongly disagree, at least currently, with that uh, – with that assessment. Anyway, Tate, let me ask you this question. UNC has shot 128 threes this year. They're shooting 41.4% as a team. Opponents are shooting 33%, but have shot more. Why doesn't Carolina shoot more threes? I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to say this. I mean, this might be controversial. I, I like that we have the driving length. I, I like that we have the spacing. I, I appreciate that was Hubert's calling card, right? We're going to, we're going to space the floor. We're going to have, Brady Manick and Dawson and these guys shoot threes, but it's one thing if those threes, I mean, as we all know, if it's a bad shot, it leads to transition and that leads to problems. And I think we're taking a lot of shots that are, I would not deem good shots and they're turning into who transition points for other teams and they're getting out on the run and they're doing what I, I assume that we used to do, right? We would get on the boards and we would get out in transition and, and that seems to not necessarily be the calling card of this team currently. I would like Brady Manick to shoot more threes. I would like RJ Davis um, to, to maybe shoot some more threes or to be more active in, in a role off the dribble. Um, I would like to see him on the ball more. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing to me. I like Caleb's talent. I think there's no one that could deny Caleb's talent, right? I mean, you, you look at the kid, this guy's so talented. I mean, what a, what a great scoring guard. But Carolina needs a point guard. We need someone to, to take on the, the shoulder of that responsibility. And maybe Caleb is that guy. I hope he can be. But someone – we need to define the roles of this team. And, and if it's – you're the you're the specialist three-point shooter, Brady Manick, be be 100% that for us. You know what I mean? If, if Caleb's going to be this guy, be that 100% for us. And um, I just feel like right now it's a feeling out process every single game. And uh, – Yes, I would like them to shoot more threes, but not if they're going to lead to transition points and bad shots. So I have a question for the panel. What six games in um, in an exhibition, what, what do you think of the new style? I think um, a lot of people said, well, UNC needs to modernize and two bigs is the wrong approach. Um, mm -hmm. What do we think about what we've seen through six games, just aesthetically? Greg, you can go. I, I mean, I I kind of like it. But you got to finish at the rim if you're going to play this way consistently. You got to have guards that can finish at the rim. You got to have Baycott being stronger with the ball at the rim, even though he's been fantastic at times. Um, it let those guys from Asheville wipe him out more than once. Uh, I mean, I just think it, there, it's still a work in progress. Um, but if you're going to have the driving lanes, you got to drive and you got to dunk the ball if you're 6'9. I mean, you just got to every time. Greg, go ahead. Yeah, I think offensively it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, just look at the, the weekend in Connecticut. Um, I mean, Dawson Garcia really gave North Carolina a chance to win on Saturday against Purdue. Brady Manick prevented the game on Sunday from becoming just a abysmal blowout, even worse than it was because he had a good game. And I, I think utilizing the stretch four in that manner 
is good. And I agree with opening the floor and those kind of things. Um, you know, Baycott, when they make an emphasis to get him the ball on the block consistently, he's shown that he can be really good. And granted, Purdue's got two elite bigs. Not many teams are like that. Uh, defensively, however, I think that's kind of where the problem is, is because uh, I know we saw a little bit of a change against Asheville, but the whole idea of not helping off as much so that you don't give up the open three-point shot, I mean, the, the data through five games was not good whatsoever because not only was the three-point defense about the same as we've seen in recent years, but teams were having a whole lot more success getting to the rim. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tennessee had, what, 21 layups, which is just absurd. And a lot of them were just straight line drives. Just layup line layups. Yeah, it really was. So we saw a little bit of a change against Asheville. I'm curious to see how that plays out in the weeks to come. If he's making adjustments, maybe to go back to more of a sagging defense uh, to to make sure you have guys that can can roll over and help and stop some of that penetration. Uh, But offensively, I, I think it's been good thus far. Wasn't that change? Didn't that change lead to more wide open threes because they began helping more, kind of like what we saw last year? Yes, I think that's kind of what um, was happening with that, and you can give that up to Asheville, a bad shooting Asheville team. Right? Yeah, but I don't know. So I think that's kind of the when we talk about learning, I think that is, and he's talked about adjusting based on teams and scouting reports and things like that. Um, I guess that was more about who's playing, who's starting, rather than. The, what happens on the court. So I understand that. Um, but offensively, I think when this team is not being stagnant, the potential for the new offense is extremely high. And we've seen it run extremely high. But when they're not, and you're just taking guys one-on-one, then it's some of the same issues as last year. Turnovers, bad shots. You got Leaky taking a shot with his heel on the three-point line. Um, you've got RJ shooting quickly. I think that's kind of what you see when they're not moving. But when ev- all five guys are moving or four guys that are moving that don't have the ball, then the space is created and exemplified even more so than when not. And I, we saw that. And I think that was the difference in the first 15 minutes last night and the last 25 as far as outscoring Asheville guys were moving versus not and I think that's kind of the horcrux of this offense is when guys aren't moving I think when you said stagnant you misspelled mispronounced selfish and and that's what I see when I watch them um going one-on-one and time as far as defense but if you're gonna go ahead but if the guy with the ball doesn't have his four teammates moving how does that make the guy with the ball selfish I understand, like, if they're taking guys one-on-one, it's selfish. But if the other four guys aren't doing their job and are not moving, I don't that, that, I don't believe that's as selfish as if they are moving and they're setting screens and you – if the, if a screen is set and you're taking off and you're double-teamed and you could easily give it to your role, that's selfish. But if the other four guys aren't moving, I don't see that as selfish. Who yeah, said I, you had to be selfish with the ball? Can you not be selfish just standing there and standing and just around? just calling for the ball but not moving? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and one thing Dewey said, and Sherelle's going to correct me, I feel it, but I'm going to get this out. One thing Dewey said is that he doesn't see a lot of guys, like even when you're just running around and running without, running without the basketball, or moving without the basketball, you still set a screen for somebody. Like if two guys are coming at each other and you're going to cross each other, One guy sets a screen for the other, even if it's not even part of the play or whatever. And those guys just – there's just guys running around and calling for the ball, and the ball comes down in the block, and the guy gets it, and he's got the three on the the corner three or the elbow three, and he just takes it weak to the basket. I don't know. I I just think the defense is another whole issue. Defense is want to and desire. If you're going to have one rim protector, which is Baycott, you better have some guards that can lock down the front. Uh, the the outside and Carolina hadn't shown that and I think they can they just don't go ahead Sherelle yeah a a couple of things so I do agree with Gregory in that we have to be careful about using selfish uh because I think sometimes players can look selfish and it's not that they're being selfish it's that they're trying to make something happen so there's a fine line there and then I think we have to be careful too about conflating energy and effort because they're there to me they're two kind of separate things you can have, I think, effort maybe without energy. And I think that's what you saw against Tennessee. Like, yeah, I don't think they were just, they're not trying. I just think their energy wasn't where it was supposed to be 
they got up for Purdue. And then it was just kind of like, oh, we got a game today, whatever. So I, I think to me, those are, are we have to make sure we separate those two things because I, it's hard for me to believe that they just weren't trying, even though it, it might have looked like a good times. I think that is a lack of energy coming through. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because I do think sometimes it can look like someone's being selfish, but really they're just trying to make a play. Um, so, and they've been given the, you know, the autonomy to do that by the head coach. So I just want to be careful about selfish because that, that, that can go down, you know, kind of the wrong path. I, I think when you start talking about that, you start talking about chemistry and everything. Um, maybe lack of awareness is, is a better phrase to me uh, than, than selfish. Just personal opinion. Sherelle is uh, the guy I need sitting on my shoulder, like slapping me saying, don't say it that way. No, what he actually meant. Go ahead, Greg. I know you had a, cre- a, a question for our special guest. So before we, we switch over to, to football, Tate, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you your, your take on the uh, ACC landscape and especially uh, the final grand year of uh, one oh, Mike Krzyzewski. <laughs> I can't believe that uh, this, this kid got away with uh, – it's not his fault, obviously. I blame the media. But I can't believe that we're dealing with Paulo Bancaro. And, and I had every draft guy call him Paolo Banchero to me for a year. And now they're calling him Paulo Bancaro. So that is like, that's, that's thrown me for a loop. I, I, it's hard for me even to stay on the straight and narrow with Coach K's farewell tour because I'm so upset that the number one, number two pick, whatever you want to call it, ha- has seemingly changed. It's a very Trayvon DeVal situation where I, I don't even know what his name is anymore. Um, but Coach K... I'm surprised he hasn't made comments about Carolina. And I, and I think that's what we should expect by January. I think if Carolina continues on the same trajectory, Coach K is going to start making comments about North Carolina. He's going to start acting concerned. And as soon as he does that, Greg, I, I am going to I'm, – I'm turning heel on him, and I'm going – I'm not being sarcastic anymore. I'm actually turning on Coach K and going at him head-to-head. Because um, if, he's, if he's making swarmy remarks about North Carolina and the program and where they are and acting like Duke is some superior program, I can't put up with that. And I and I feel like that's what we're leaning towards as we move into, uh, you know, ACC play in the Coach K era. And regardless of how everything goes this year for Hubert Davis, yeah, if he somehow is able to get this team to beat Duke on senior night on Coach K's final game in Cameron – all will be mm. forgotten. Hubert will be able yes. to coach in Chapel Hill for as long as he wants. Absolutely. 100% agree. It, it feels <clears> to <throat> me very J.J. Reddick senior night in 2006. Right, right. right. Like, like if, if Ty, when Tyler Hanzo hit that three in Cameron, I think it like it was to give us a 13-point lead. It was like a top of the key three. It was like 80 to 67 or something like that. He hit that three, and it was like the roof went off the floor. I mean, obviously it was silent in Cameron, but, you know, my whole fate, we're just going crazy. I feel like that could be that game for Hubert where everyone is on board and uh, – we, we finally get some joy. We need some joy. Hubert needs – he deserves some joy. And, I, and I, I don't want to be the part like the national guys that are saying, oh, Wes Miller or it's Hubert's fault. I don't – I'm not putting this all square on Hubert. But all – what we discussed tonight, I think, is the real conversation, which is like messaging, like how do we address these things on the fly, and how do we get back to playing Carolina basketball? Because I, I, I love watching Carolina basketball, and uh, I know this team has the talent to play it. I just want to see it, so – what I've told a lot of people over the last eight months, they're like, well, yeah, Hubert just doesn't have any experience. Yeah, he doesn't. What did you want him to do? Turn the job down? <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, yeah. Before we let you go, Tate, is anybody in the ACC any good? No. Okay. All right. I mean, I mean, I, and Greg, I would, I would honestly love to hear, like, once you start going to these places and seeing these teams, I mean, I try to talk myself. I, I think Virginia Tech's my favorite team of all the ACC teams. I think they're the Great. toughest team. I think they're the team that lasts the longest in March. Um, I think Duke is a house of cards. I, I think Duke could easily collapse if something goes. It almost already did, as we all know, Coach K's grandson. Um, we, we, we were close to some issues there. So I'm not really buying in on Duke. I obviously am a little worried about North Carolina. I think Virginia Tech's your best bet. But if we're in the pool where we're talking – Tony Bennett's a whole other conversation, by the way. As much as everyone, we're all talking about North Carolina, I mean, Virginia, they're, they don't, their culture, and they're having a lot of conversations up there right now about their team. So there's no one in the ACC I feel really sure of fire about. But Mike Young, I mean, what he did at Wofford and what he's been able to do at Virginia Tech, especially early in the season with some of these upsets, I like them. And they're the toughest team, I think, in the ACC. He's got a lot of guys that can handle the ball, plays that spread out style, and 
a lot of veteran and, guys, which helps. Too. And Storm Murphy's back for anyone that didn't realize right. that he still plays college basketball. So <laughs> he's like team. 37 years old. <laughs> didn't he hit a bunch of threes against Carolina and Will and Jim? I mean, yeah. good gracious. <laughs> I mean, KJ Smith was the starting point guard. I know. I mean, I know it's Carmichael, folks. I, I mean, I'm just making he's an old man reference. Tate, man, it's been awesome that you joined us. We're going to switch over to to football and, and lament that as well. Hey, anytime you want to get in on one of these basketball pods, you let us know. Hit us up, and you can certainly join us. I appreciate it. Tate, what's I'm your you guys. game prediction for Friday? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm I'm terrified <laughs> of that game. I'm stay. This is a stay away game for me. I mean, I, I oh, you guys know all signs point to this is not going to be a fun day to be a North Carolina football fan. But I do like that they have all the pressure on this. This is a very situation where I would assume if you told me at the start of the year Carolina would have the the title game on the other side and State would ruin it for us. So maybe we get to play spoiler for once um, and, and ruin NC State's Thanksgiving. So let's hope for that on Friday. Good deal, my man. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks, Tate. Appreciate you, John. Bye, yeah. Tate. L- listening to the Inside Carolina podcast, it's the Game Plan podcast coming up after the break. I'm host Tommy Ash. This is Gregory Hall. Greg Barnes is here. Sherelle McMillan is still here going to talk a little football. I know he is. Uh, he's become our, our favorite football guest and favorite with the fans. And uh, Jason Staples may join us, may not. I don't know. He's traveling. It's Thanksgiving holidays. Um, if he gets here, I hope he does. If he doesn't then uh, I'll do my best staples. Uh, I need to get something to eat on air and all that stuff. I already already ate dinner on air. Yeah, so uh, Gregory Hall's got it covered. Let's let the national guys pay the bills. Oh, Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Sherelle, do me a read. Do me a read for them. Come on, Sherelle. You're my guy. I'm I'm sick, man. I'm I'm struggling. Uh, Johnny T-Shirt, owned by UNC alums on Franklin Street. Been there for a long, long time. I think the first time I went to Johnny T-shirt was, I want to say 1993 with my uncle. Uh, stopped by, got a signed Larry Davis uh, autographed shirt. So for those of you who are old who know who Larry Davis is, you know that that's a long time ago. So what that says is, is that Johnny T-shirt can take care of all your needs, jerseys, shirts, polos, shorts, anything you need for Christmas. It's cold outside, hoodies, sweatshirts, they have everything. Uh, I see members can save 10% off their everyday order with the code found on the premium message board. So support the people that support Inside Carolina and go to Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. Good deal. National guys are going to pay the bills for the audio version. We'll be right back on the beat and game plan live with InsideCarolina.com. All right, folks, welcome back on the beat live. It's now over. This is game plan land. Yeah game plan live carolina and nc state at 7 30 in carter finley stadium on what i expect to be an absolutely insane night in raleigh um i greg i really can't imagine a situation where this game will be even more where this game has been as crazy and will be as crazy as what we could see in raleigh um given the stakes nc state of course still in the atlantic um hunt And quite frankly, I think if they win the Atlantic, they've got a great chance to be ACC champions. Carolina not having being not having the season they expected, but still has um, a little bit better bowl to play for. But most importantly, on Friday, a chance to break a lot of NC State hearts. Greg, Um, Carolina has not been good on the road away at night, and here we are talking about a game that's on the road away at night. Give me your overall thoughts before we dig into it. Yeah, and the NC State, 6-0 at home. I think they're trying to become uh, undefeated at home for the first time in a long time. Uh, so a lot of things going in NC State's favor. And I really think the fact that uh, that Clemson beat Wake Forest last week and State looked really good and take care of business against Syracuse uh, to keep State in the Atlantic Division race. I think that's good for North Carolina because, as you mentioned, all of the pressure is on NC State. And, yeah, it's going to be a packed house and it's going to be wild and a lot of vicious things are going to be said like like typical. Uh, but North Carolina is bowl eligible. Um, you know, whether or not they win, it's not really going to hurt where they go. I suspect they'll end up in Charlotte. Uh, and so this is an opportunity. And as disappointing as this season has been, I mean, you know, a couple of months ago, North Carolina was, was number 10 in the country. 
as disappointed as this year has been, to close out with a, a win on the road against a ranked opponent who just happens to be your rival who is trying to win their first ACC title since 1979, uh, you, can, you can take some momentum from that, and you can really use that to, to move forward and say, you know what? It wasn't the year we wanted. We're still headed in the right direction. We're going to use this as kind of a springboard in the spring ball uh, and then start this over again and try to have a better year next year. So a lot of opportunity for North Carolina, but it is going to be a very difficult game for them on Friday night. Gregory, NC State and Carolina. Um, have you been to Carter Finley? Have you covered a game in Carter Finley? Have you been in the stands in Carter Finley? Have you been to a Carolina State game in Carter Finley? I covered a Carolina State game in Carter Finley, I guess. Was, was that that, that was maybe two years ago when Greg was elsewhere and I yeah, um, 19. Yeah, it was 19. That was when I got criticized by people I now tailgate with for not being at the state game in Raleigh. And I was like, I'm literally on an airplane coming back from covering Bahamas, Carolina right? basketball. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Gregory, what do you think? I This game is extremely intriguing. and It's been intriguing since, uh, I guess, what was it? Um, maybe the Miami game is when we started talking about, man, like if it comes down to UNC versus NC State and Carolina can ruin State's chances and UNC is fighting for a bowl game, that would be a lot of fun. Now, UNC beat Wake Forest, so they are in to the bowl game, and State lost to Wake, so Wake can still just beat – what do they play? They play Boston College on Saturday. Yeah. Um, Boston but, College has their quarterback. Yes, but the sentiment still – remains um, that this game is extremely intriguing because, and Sam Howell said it, this is probably the best defense that UNC will have faced all year. Um, I think it's up there with uh, maybe a toss-up between Pitt and Notre Dame, um, in my opinion. But, I mean, these, these state players, these linebackers, they play physical exactly how you want them to play. Um, and then you look at a guy like Devin Leary and – State fans throw the disrespect card around, and you look at some of the numbers that Leary's put up, and he's right up there with some guys that have won or been to New York for the Heisman. It's just the pl the quarterback play. I know the as far as draft wise has been down, but the numbers that some of these guys are putting up is pretty pretty remarkable. And Devin Leary is right up there, and because he's got one of the deepest receiving cores in the ACC, um, Amezi. Uh, is it Thayer De Thomas, the receiver? Yeah, and Devin um, Carter, the Clayton kid, man. Come uh, on, you got to yeah, talk about Devin. That town over there that Tommy lives in. Um, it's just this team is really good. And then you've got the best left tackle. He plays left tackle, best left tackle in the country. Even though like their run game, I'm looking at PFF, I've got my matchups article coming out. The run game is not as explosive as their passing game, but they still have Bam Knight – Ricky person that they can throw back there. Like they're a good solid team, but it's a rivalry game and I'm excited and I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, UNC's defense could lay down. UNC's defense could do something and UNC's offense could not do anything or it could be a back and forth game for the entire time. Um, so it, there's a lot of interesting matchups here. Sherelle, um, you, you came dressed for the occasion. With the red shirt. I hope that's just my computer screen, not really accurate on the colors. Um, but you've watched Carolina and State football forever as well. Um, has there been a bigger one, at least for, for NC State, in this rivalry that you can think of? Not that I can remember. I mean, 2001, I think UNC went and won 17-9 at Carter-Finley. That was a big game. Um, Phillip Rivers, I, I think they were – they had a good record, I'm pretty sure. Those were two really good teams. They might have been two ranked teams. Um, it's funny that the two teams aren't ranked very often when they play. Uh, I'm sure Greg has looked at the numbers, but I would guess maybe twice in the three, last 20 years. Three years ago, right? Or not three years ago, last year. Last year they were both ranked, but I mean. I mean, there, there was a whole conference not playing yet. So, you know, that's the COVID year. Anyway, um, yeah, I think for NC State, this is the most probably they've they've had on the line for themselves. Um, most of the time, it is, can we, talking to State, can we ruin North Carolina season? Um, and I, it's kind of interesting that the shoe's on the other foot. So I'm curious, 
North Carolina with no pressure whatsoever to really do anything in this game. I think it should be treated like a bowl game because it is the last game that matters um, on the schedule. And I know people won't like that, but and all apologies to the Duke Mayo people if UNC ends up there, but that game doesn't matter. It's an exhibition game. It's about selling tickets and it's kind of game zero for next year. Um, this could be the last game of Sam Howe's career uh, at UNC. So um, I think they should just throw, throw everything out the window, just do whatever it takes to win the game. Um, and that's why I, I joke, but like they should have stayed in Raleigh for the week and, you know, took a tour of the Capitol and just treat honestly treated it like a bowl game. Cause that's what it is. Um, there's no greater opportunity than to ruin your, your rival season. So we'll, we'll see what happens on Friday. And there's a lot of times over the last few years too. And Greg, you know, this too, when, NC State had nothing to lose. Uh, I guess it was 2016. They came into Chapel Hill and just destroyed them. Carolina was the better team. They had a better record. They still had an opportunity to go to a higher level bowl game and just got destroyed by a team who was not as good as them. So um, Carolina has a hope they can do that on Friday. Yeah, and I think that 2016 game, uh, Virginia Tech played at the same time. I think both of those were 12 o'clock games. If Virginia Tech had lost to Virginia, if Carolina had beaten State, Carolina could have still won the Coastal. So kind of an inverse of what's going on here. Uh, Rel mentioned the, the 01 game, Tommy. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into story time here. 20-year uh, anniversary. So my brother, uh, unfortunately, is a diehard Pack fan, has been forever. Went to school there. He's, he's much older than I am. Had a birthday recently. Happy birthday, Wes. Uh, but he invited me to go to that 01 game uh, with his wife. And I think my – our other brother's wife came up with them because they're coming up from the Charlotte area. Uh, and, and I went to the game in his, my brother-in-law's place. And I was yeah, probably 25 at the time. And I was feeling it in the Wolfpack club section, uh, was quite full of myself throughout that entire game uh, and was still like that after the game. And so we're <laughs> tailgating after the game and I'm just, barking at anybody who would listen to me so i'm sitting here watching the game i'll never forget it sitting in a camp chair and somebody had set up a tv on the back of their pickup truck and i'm watching it and over to my left is my brother and some of his friends and i yell at my brother to throw me a beer so i've got a plate in my lap with pulled barbecue and uh and, and beans and coleslaw and everything and so my brother sure enough picks up a beer can a uh, beer can a can of beer and just chucks at me and it hit it, I mean, great throw nails me right on the plate and that food just goes everywhere uh and i'd had a a beer or two and i was just done and he was done with me and we both charged at each other and for the next probably 15 minutes we are rolling around in the nc state parking lot with a crowd around us uh, fighting his wife had driven all the way up from the Charlotte area, from Gastonia. And she got to the point, she was so furious with us because we were rolling around in the dirt and fighting that she got in the car and left. And that was our ride home. We had a bachelor party in Charlotte to be at that night because I think that was a 12 o'clock game. And so we call and we're like, hey, come, come get us. And she was gone. She's like halfway to Gastonia. Uh, and so we were like, man, what are we going to do? So we were able to find uh, one of our random friends who happened to be at the game and he gave us a ride to charlotte and we were just in time for the bachelor party so that was 20 years ago for this uh this rivalry matchup so you need to come hang out in the parking lot with us <laughs> in raleigh on, on friday and greg uh, that was that was my first game in carter finley that was the first time i had ever been that day that was yeah that was that they had some good teams with with rivers so that was a that was a tense afternoon greg's a big had... philip rivers fan oh yeah the dude was good. I mean, yeah. give him credit. He was good in the pros, too. I mean, so you can't really – I mean, you can hate on him, but you can't hate on what oh, he was I able love to Philip accomplish. <laughs> well, I wouldn't – I didn't go that far now. Come on now. I mean, you made me have to edit this out. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the game. And, folks, if uh, – are expecting Jason Staples, we are too. But he said he'd be here in about five <laughs> minutes. And um, Jason's been traveling. And, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts. But, Greg – and we can kind of talk about this all the way around is, you know, for whatever reason, the reputations of these two schools are very different. Um, and we've talked a lot about Carolina getting pushed around this year, but when they've played NC state, especially under Mac Brown uh, and one year, one or two years under Larry Fedora, 
they have really pushed around NC State. I mean, two years ago in 19, they manhandled NC State. And then last year in, in Keenan, you know, an empty Keenan, they were able to sort of do the same thing. Why are the reputations so divergent for these two teams, Greg? It's a good question, Tommy. And I, I think it was interesting this week that Dave Doran has really stressed the fact that last year, for example, Devin Leary was out for this game and Bailey Hockman was the starting quarterback. Uh, and apparently something similar happened the year before. So he's, his comment was, I'm, I'm glad to finally have our starting quarterback to play against North Carolina after not having it the last couple of years. Um, so that kind of speaks to, to some of the, the attitude uh, conversation that's going around. But it really is the, the rushing component of this, of, of football in general is key. But Buck Sanders has really kind of beaten home the, the fact that if you look at this particular, particular matchup, um, whoever wins the rushing battle wins the game. And that goes to the physicality aspect of it. Um, and so North Carolina the last two years has had a much better rushing attack. You know, talking about Javante Williams and, and Michael Carter. Uh, and so they've been able to dominate up front. And you know, when, when State had a lot of success with Russell Wilson and Phillip Rivers, you, yeah, those guys were good but they were able to establish that identity up front. And I think that's really kind of the key component is who can win at the line of scrimmage because there's just so many physical plays in this type of game that if, if you can establish a dominance in the trenches, you give yourself a, a good advantage. And some of these games have been lopsided. I mean, a lot of those Butch Davis games, surprisingly, were lopsided in NC State's favor. A lot of 41-10 games. The last two years have been that way for North Carolina. And of course, you look at the last couple of years in Mac 1.0, there's a lot of blowouts there as well in favor of North Carolina. So I really think that's kind of the component that, that everybody should be looking at is who is able to be most physical up front. Sherelle, I know you got to drop out. Appreciate you um, sticking with us uh, and, and doing it on a with, with a little sickness. I'll give you credit for joining us, but let me get before you go. I want to get your breakdown on what will happen Friday night in Raleigh over there in Carter Friendly Stadium. Oh, I have zero expectations from a UNC standpoint, to be honest. I mean, yeah, you, you'd like to see them play well um, and, and have a chance for Sam Howell to win the game in the fourth quarter. But between what we've seen defensively from them, uh, from the Wofford game, um, and then the first half of the Pittsburgh game, um, and then most of the Wake Forest game, and all of the Notre Dame game, and all of the Miami game, um, it's hard to imagine them being able to keep State from scoring, you know, 30, 35, 37 points. And even with the starters that State's missing on defense, I just don't know if North Carolina can score enough to uh, keep pace because the defense is so poor. Now, I know NC State doesn't run a lot, but Again, as Greg said, and he points out every year, and his bucks are written in the column, they know that this game is about running the football. So I would expect him to have a, a better effort in that regard. So, I mean, it, your, your hope is that Carolina can keep it within three to seven entering the fourth quarter and then go out and make some magic happen. But I, I just – I don't see it at this point. Um, so maybe they'll come out and, and surprise us. But um, it would be a surprise if they were able to win. Hopefully they do, but it would be a surprise. <laughs> All right, my man, Sherelle McMillan is going to drop out. And uh, Jason Staples says he's trying to get in. He's got Wi-Fi problems. Sherelle, appreciate it. Yep, thanks, Sherelle. Yep, get well. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, Greg, while we're waiting for uh, Jason and, and Gregory, too, let, let's talk about um, the absence of Conley for North Carolina. I was just about How, to bring that up. Is that as big a deal as I think it is for this team? Greg? I, well, go ahead, Gregory. Yeah. Sorry. I think it really dictates how NC State attacks Carolina because, as Sherelle just said, NC State has doesn't really run it as much as UNC does, and UNC has almost 100 more rushes than State does. And a lot of that is Sam Howell, right? But um, And it's also just them trusting Devin Leary and their receivers and just playing off their strengths. If JQ was in, I think you might see – them continue that with throwing it in the air um, because, I mean, obviously he can play everywhere, but he's a better run defender than he is a pass defender, in my opinion. 
um, and kind of what we've seen on the field as well. I think that's why he got moved back to nickel so they can just take advantage of other, like his strengths and then other player strengths. So with what Greg said earlier, I think this really does become more of a trenches battle, which favors NC State. But I mean, if you look at the numbers, State's outside of maybe quarterback play. And even then, I mean, Devin Leary's had a fantastic season. Um, Sam Howell's had a better career. But, I mean, State's just on paper is a better team. So I think it's the absence of Curious Conley, I think, really makes it even more of a trenches battle than it would have been if he was playing. Greg, yeah, the, when... the, the, the physicality aspect of Conley, I think, is was huge here because Carolina, if you're not physical for it with NC State, you're not going to beat them. Sure. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And compounding the issue is the fact that the Don Chapman was your guy that could play every position in the secondary. And he was your starting nickel to start the year. Um, so you, you don't have him, and now you don't have Conley. And you're already down Hollins uh, at one cornerback position. So you're just incredibly thin. And fortunately for North Carolina, Gia Biggers has played really well. We, we know Cam Kelly has really stepped up at, at safety which is going to allow them to move Trey Morrison back to nickel, which is where he's played a lot uh, throughout his career. So they at least have some experience there. But, you know, I mean, just look at Trey next of Conley, completely different. I mean, Conley's basically a, a linebacker that can run really fast. Right. And Morrison's really a cornerback that, you know, he's not afraid to put his head in there. Uh, but, but certainly that I think that's a component of it. You also lose the ability to, to sub in and out. And so – uh, in addition to the, the running component, uh, I think you'll see, you know, Porter Rooks and, and Thayer Thomas and even Ricky Person. I, mean, I think Person's got like, what, 27 catches on the year. They're not afraid to throw to the running backs. Uh, so you'll be able to see those guys in, in action more probably over the middle, just trying to exploit some of those, some of that thin depth that the North Carolina has, especially at Nickelback. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, this is a game, Mike Brown's talked about it, but this is a game that, um, Jonathan Kim could be an MVP. Keep the ball out of Bam Knight's hands on kickoff returns. So he's got one in each of the last two weeks. He should have had two, I guess, against Wake Forest. And so you've got that aspect of it. And Bam's a good running back. And and I'm surprised watching NC State with those two backs. I'm surprised State hasn't run it a ton more. I agree with um, you. And and I guess they just trust Leary. But I I think. And, Greg, we mentioned the 2016 game. If if my memory serves, and I could be wrong because I mix up these, State just ran it all day in 16. I think it was 16 where they just said they're going to mash Carolina. And um, it, it would not surprise me to see them do that on Friday night. Um, but Carolina's going to have to step up and match it. Who is Carolina's defensive stalwart in this game then, Greg? Without Conley out there. Um, to sort of lead that charge. I mean, is it Miles Murphy? Is it Cayman Rucker? Is it going to be Gimmel? Uh, who has to really step up? I think Cam Kelly could have a huge game. I think if, if Kelly has an interception, um, then Carolina wins. Who is it going to be for Carolina on the defensive side? Because Jay Bateman has taken a ton of heat. And if State puts up 40, 45, 50 points in Raleigh on Friday night, I can't even begin to imagine. Um the firestorm that's going to come towards that coaching staff in the Keenan Football Center. NC oh, yeah. State ran it 53 times in 2016, by the way. So for you 259 were right, yards. Yep. For 259. I just remember they said, we're going to run it. If you don't stop us, well, you're not going to – if you can't stop us, we're going to keep running. That's the one time that a team – because Pittsburgh used to be able to run it well on Fedora's teams, and then they just quit running it. Even James Conner didn't run it enough and that's why Larry Fedor had success because Narduzzi would do stupid stuff where Doran was coaching for his job that day Baylor and he just put well Baylor was a different animal Baylor had their eighth string quarterback out there but Doran will go to that well over and over but anyway Greg who's got to step up for Carolina's defense well Jay Bateman kind of tipped his hand a little bit which I mean I think everybody understands this North Carolina is not good enough defensively to shut down everything. They're just not. The, the defense is a fringe top 100 defense. Um, and I really think that in, in talking with people around the program, they feel like they did a really good job against Virginia 
in terms of controlling the game the way they wanted to. And I know uh, Brendan Armstrong said all kinds of passing records, but North Carolina made Virginia one dimensional in that game. And that's for a defense like this, that struggles, you have to be able to do that. And, and Bateman said on Monday that you, there's a lot of different things that NC state does well, but if you can, if you can take away the run, that at least gives you a fighting chance. And so because of that, Tommy, I really, I mean, in North Carolina last year, if you look at the, the results of that game, um, you know, State rushed 19 times for 34 yards. And they made NC State one-dimensional. And that was and even so, with Bailey Hockman and what's his name, Ryan Finley out there right. that were not good. Right, exactly. And I think the same thing applies. So uh, I think it's got to be the guys up front. And uh, Raymond Vahasic had a very good season. I mean, he's he's rated the the fourth highest defensive lineman in the ACC according to PFF with uh, linemen that have at least 200 snaps. So he's played really well this year. Uh, but then also you've got Miles Murphy, and it, we we've seen Jay in recent weeks really kind of platoon up front where you you've seen Jaleel Taylor get some snaps, you've seen Kevin Hester come in and get some snaps along with Javari Ritzy, um, and I think that's going to be the key is is keep the guys fresh but really lean on them. And if you can slow state down, and as, as we talked about, state's not a team that runs the ball a lot effectively anyway. But if you can really limit what they can do on the ground and at least put Devin Leary in some obvious passing downs, I think that's your best chance to get off the field. They've had two games against ACC opponents where they averaged more than four yards a carry, Miami and Wake. And against Wake, they were at 4.1, and they only ran the ball 18 times. Like, they're just not – both of them right so their best running attacks they lost both those games so i think it's just it's very intriguing and very interesting to see especially i mean how do you deal um just how do you deal with ekwonu right do you oh like normally jay bateman moves to mon fox both sides do you just leave him on the right tackle side the whole game how do you just and let other guys deal with him? How do you scheme up against that? Jason I, Staples has joined us. Uh, let's see what he has to say. Jason, I don't know what kind of connection you got, but we'll try it out. Uh, Carolina's defense, wh- what do they need to do to win this game Friday night against NC State, a team that has not run it but appears to have a pretty good running attack, but a quarterback that's been great, wide outs that have been solid. Um, what's Bateman's angle here? Hey, guys. Big gulps, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, um, sorry about that. Uh, had some Wi-Fi issues when I actually arrived here. So uh, as we uh, as we get going uh, on my end of things, uh, yeah, I think defensively the, the biggest thing is, as, as, uh, as was already being said, as Greg said, you really want them to be one dimensional. So you have to, you have to win up front to win this game. You have to limit them in the running game because that's where they've been able to get limited teams that have beaten them have been able to limit their running game, uh, you know, reasonably well and have kept them from being, uh, from being two dimensional. But uh, the other, the other big thing is I think, really where they've hurt teams the most when they've won is with their big receivers winning downfield. And you really have to keep from uh, letting, uh, letting those guys on the out, on the outside uh, beat you. And that's where I think, you know, especially with duck in the line, in the lineup, you feel pretty, pretty good about those matchups against Amezi in particular. I mean, he's a guy, he's been around forever. (laughs) <laughs> but you know you're looking at six three plus you know big receiver that generally has a, a matchup advantage over over cornerbacks just size wise and uses that size really well he's not going to have a big size advantage against carolina's corners uh and the same thing on the other side so you, you look at this uh Amezi and devin carter you know those are guys that they're going to be they're going to be going hard at uh and i think one of the one of the keys to the game here is Carolina is going to have to win those matchups with Carolina's corners one on one. They got to be able to cover those outside guys, because to me, the guy I'm most concerned about probably coming into this game is 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 really Thayer Thomas, the the slot receiver with uh, with Jaquarius Conley out uh, with 
with uh, uh, Don Chapman. Chapman out with with you know basically your first two options at the nickel out. Thayer Thomas is a good nickel, or I mean, is a good slot corner, and he's going or a slot receiver, and he's going to give you your nickel corner some trouble, even if it is your first guy. So they're going to have to find ways to to cover on the inside against uh, Thayer Thomas and also Porter Rooks, who's who's got some good speed uh, on the inside. Those slot guys are guys that I'm really concerned about if I'm Jay Bateman and I'm trying to find ways to make sure that I don't put myself in situations where those guys have significant matchup advantages and can make big plays. So uh, to me, if they're able to one-on-one match up and, and handle business on the outside and then find some ways to bracket and use some things on the inside to cause some confusion or to, uh, to just take away some of the matchups that, that state's going to want to use then it basically requires that NC State be able to run it, and that's where they've got to control the line of scrimmage. And, and, and I think they put themselves in position to win the game if they do those three things. That's not a big ask. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, Emeka Amizi, or whatever his name is, has it, been solid. I don't want to mispronounce it again, so I won't try. And then Devin Carter has shown that – Devin's shown that he, he will make some big plays, but he'll also turn it over and then also has some drops. Amizi has shown that he's been solid all year. And, uh, but you're right, Thayer Thomas. What's interesting to me is Carolina's defense goes against Josh Downs every day in practice. So you, they ought to be able to have some familiarity with, with, a, with a slot that can make plays. Greg. Yeah, but Josh um, Downs also torches those guys every day in practice. So. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> at least they, they know what's coming, at least, I, I guess, you know, even if it is a train at the other end of the light bulb. Greg, the defensive line, um, we've talked all year uh, about getting pressure or not getting pressure with four, having to blitz. I don't think Carolina can blitz a ton in this game, can they? Or do you think they have to against NC State? We haven't seen Jay blitz a whole lot this year, just in general. Um, he does a little bit, but but not a ton. So I don't, I don't expect that to change. Um He's going to keep trying to get some pressure off the edge. He's got a lot of guys that he relies on, whether it be Taman, Des Evans, Chris Collins, um, Kamon Rucker. And he, he's asking Raven Hosick to kind of hold things up in the middle and, and to allow those linebackers to come up. So I, I, don't, I don't think you're going to see a ton of blitzes. Um, but it's one of those things, too. I mean, if you're not getting any, any pressure whatsoever um, – I mean, you can't allow a guy like Devin Leary to sit back there and have all day to throw. We talk about these stats all the time, but but Leary, when, when kept clean this year, um, he's completing 72% of his passes, 27 touchdowns, four interceptions. Under pressure, he's completing 44% of his passes, four touchdowns, one interception. And that's why I that, – that is one of the reasons that I actually think we're going to – you might be surprised, Greg. I think you're going to see a, more pressure packages in this game than we've seen all year from Jay Bateman. What do you think that looks like? So I, I think you're going to see five and six rushers going at the quarterback a lot in this game. And the reason why is, what, number one, you see the difference between Leary under pressure versus not. That's a huge gap. And secondly – any, uh, anybody have any guesses on how many rushing yards Leary has on the season? Negative 25. Negative 43. So right in that same, I mean, he's not, he's not running for anything. So it, it, that's one of those things where it, one of the dangers, if you're, if you're playing against dual threat guys, if you blitz, you better get him. <laughs> right? You, you're not sure where he's going to be. And if you blitz and you miss him, that's a lot of green grass for a guy that can run. So a lot of, a lot of times when you're playing against dual threat guys, you're, you're more hesitant to, to bring pressure because you've got to keep those guys in position to, to make the tackle and avoid big plays. With a guy like Leary, Leary, you know where he's going to be. He, he's, he's not quite a statue, but he's awfully close to it. And if you know that, now you can, you can blitz from four or five different spots. You can even be unsound sometimes. And when he breaks the pocket, okay, he might get five, six yards instead of 30. And to me, the, the, the benefit of getting pressure on him that we've seen all season, just based on, and you can look at it in, in, in games. If you look at his passer rating 
by game, it's really, uh, it's really pretty dramatically different in, um, in, in, in different games. I mean, let's look, let's look at his game log here. So he's gone 158 against South Florida, 115 against uh, at Mississippi state loss, 188 against Furman. Okay. Whatever. 148 against Clemson. That's a good one. That's really good against Clemson. Then 138 against Louisiana Tech, and they almost lost that game. 195 at Boston College. They won that game big. 134 the next week in a loss against Miami. 180 in a win against Louisville. 183 in a win against Florida State. 136 in a loss against Wake Forest. And then 204 against Syracuse. So, you, you, you get it. I mean, that's a 70 point swing between Wake Forest and the loss and Syracuse and the win. And the, the week before a 50 point swing. And so much of that has been contingent on whether those teams could get pressure on him. And I think that's a big, and that's one of the reasons why I started with, can the corners cover those big receivers? Cause if the corners can do it, then if I'm Jay Bateman, I am bringing pressure almost every down. Because the thing about it is that you're, you're bringing that pressure. That's also handling the run, right? You're getting guys into gaps. So as long as you're sound with your, with your pressures on that, as long as you are getting your backers and, and your linemen in the correct gaps as they rush, then you tackle the running back on the way to the quarterback. And you get pressure over and over and over again, and you just don't give up those plays uh, downfield because your corners are, are covering. But again, that's where the, the thing is, you have to make sure that you've got a little help with the slot guy when you're bringing that pressure. So you've got to be careful how you bring it, where you bring it against different formations. But I think that's going to be something I would be surprised if this is not the most pressure heavy game Carolina has had this year defensively. So, Jason, I think a lot of people listening to this are probably pulling their hair out saying, well, why hasn't North Carolina done that all season long? So why hasn't North Carolina done that all season long? <laughs> well, I mean, let's look at the schedule, right? So which quarterbacks do you look at and you go, okay, that's a guy you've got you've to really pressure. And which guys are guys that you go, mm, probably not a good idea to, uh, to go after that guy too hard. Virginia Tech. Burmeister is he a guy that that is more of a runner like is he is he a really fast guy or is he a statue yeah you want him to pass the ball you want him to throw the ball so you don't necessarily want to get into a track meet with that guy right so you're going to sit back a little bit against him and they only gave up 17 points against him so okay Virginia Armstrong's definitely a dual threat guy right right so you don't want to just bring it at him Georgia Tech (laughs) <laughs> uh, runners right those are runners you're, you're, you're playing against an option team duke ah you play a statue guess what they did they brought pressure right then florida state with jordan travis which again you know the, the difference both the both these two teams that's a common opponent nc state beat florida state uh florida state beat north carolina but they played a very different florida state nc state played florida state with mckenzie milton at quarterback totally different situation and frankly if it, it, it was one of those things where uh florida state people were saying after that game man with how that how things looked with basically what what nc state looked like on that same field florida state might have won that game against nc state with by you know 14 points with travis totally different situation they just couldn't they couldn't threaten them defensively with milton so that's a common opponent thing but if you're playing against jordan travis florida state yeah, you want that guy to throw it. <laughs> you don't want him beating, beating you with his legs. All right, Miami. Well, a little tricky, but, you know, that's a guy you want to go after more. And they did a little bit, but, they, but you know, he, he did some things with his legs as well. He moves okay. But they did go after him some. But that's, that's one where you could say maybe, maybe you go after him more. Notre Dame with Jack Cohn, they did come after him. Right? So Wake Forest, dual threat. Pittsburgh, they did come after him. Right. And, you know, they got, they got home against Kenny Pickett. I mean, they made Pickett uncomfortable. So, I mean, I think you're going to see very close to defensively the same basic defensive plan that you saw against Pitt. 
the same the same way that they defended Pitt and tried to get after Kenny Pickett, especially in the second half. That's what you'll see against NC State, and I think you'll see even a couple more pressure packages in this one. And th- uh, those were adjustments that were made. They weren't coming well, after Pickett when it was twenty-eight to three. They just or- well, they did they they did they did some in the first half, but they but they adjusted a little bit of what they did personnel wise to get to get more advantageous matchups. So that was the big adjustment. It wasn't so much what they called; it's that they they got adjustments to get this guy on this guy and you know, oh, they're going to be in this personnel and we're not matching up as well with this look. So we're going to shift our personnel a little bit. And those guys ended up beating their, be, winning their matchups. So that gets to kind of your question of, okay, well, you know, they got a pretty good offensive tackle. What do you do there? Do you rotate? You know, they'll find the best matchup and they'll, they'll stick with that. All but right, the, but a- they're going to, they're going to come after him. I, I will be, I will be surprised if Jay does not, if Bateman does not go after, after uh, NC State hard in terms of in terms of bringing blitz packages a lot in this game you better watch person out of the backfield if they're going to do that and Penix and uh Thayer Thomas like you mentioned so th- that'll be an interesting chess match there and Jason your mic's kind of hot a little bit but um, I can adjust it on the audio Fixed. version they uh so let's switch over to Carolina's side of the ball uh, I mean well, I guess if Sam Howell's playing things are much different and, and so Greg Carolina's approach offensively, whoever the quarterback may be, is it the same as it's been against NC State the last couple of years? State's pretty much – they've got better players and more experienced players on defense, but I think their defensive set's going to be pretty similar to what we've seen um, in the past two years, right? Yeah, and I really think this is a game where you, Phil Longo has talked a lot, especially the second half of the season, about really trying to utilize those those quick hitters for Sam. Uh, I think the fact that that he's banged up and everybody knows that he's banged up, um, you know, NC State's going to going to hit him as many times legally as they possibly can, and maybe a couple times illegally. And so, the quicker you get the ball out of Sam's hands, especially early in the game, uh, you can you can keep your quarterback upright. And I think that's the key component provided that Sam is able to, to go. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, if he's not able to play, it's one of the better long cons of, that I've seen, right? I mean, it's he didn't practice at all last week, didn't play, didn't even dress out against Wofford, uh, but yet they say that he's, he's ready to go. So we'll, we'll have to see exactly how he is. Um, but I do think that's, that's got to be the approach. And then you know, lean on your run game some, try to have some success there. And then if, if – you, if you're able to kind of establish what you're wanting to do offensively, then you can set up some of those max protects that we've seen in recent weeks and take some shots down the field. I just don't think you want to put Sam in a situation where, where he's going to be getting potentially getting sacked a lot because that puts him in some danger. And you don't want to have one of those young quarterbacks come in and try to win this game for you. And Jason talking about getting hit i mean how's run the ball a ton this year and it's been a gigantic part of carolina's offense you put him out there running and i mean it's gonna be open season on number seven right yeah my, my concern actually is that 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 when you're dealing with uh with how that banged up as much as they've depended on his legs this season if he's not really ready to to run and take some of those hits you wonder I mean, if they need if they need somebody who can move and who can take those hits, is it is it actually is is he actually then a liability? Is the concern, and that's what you just don't know until you know how healthy he is and how ready he is to take some of those those hits. So, but he's going to take some shots. Uh, this is where you've got to have your offensive line coming in with pride and saying we're just not going to let this guy do his thing. We're, we're, we're not going to let this defensive, this defensive lineman get to our quarterback. And we're going to play, we're going to play at a higher level than we have so far this year. And, and so far this year, we haven't seen a whole lot of that, but, but, you know, it is a rivalry game and it is a situation where you got your quarterback hurt back there. So, you know, maybe that, that gets turned up, but I do have a, a, my big concern is really that they play a lot of zero technique from the, from the nose tackle. And, you know, that, uh, that's uh, Corey Durden, the transfer from Florida State uh, on the nose. And he's a good athlete. And he's, he's a powerful guy. And that's been a problem. That's been an issue for 
uh, Carolina all season as their, their centers have been banged up and they're not, you know, super strong, you know, able to anchor guys to begin with. So to me, a big part of the success that Carolina has in this game is going to be about whether or not they can handle the, the, the nose tackle and not get pushed into the backfield or, or, you know, turnstiled at that spot all game. And that's something I'm going to be watching the first, first drive or two. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be watching, okay, what's happening at the center spot? How deep in the backfield is this guy on each snap? Is he able to get any movement? Are they, are they helping with the guard? Are they, what are they doing to, to help there uh, to make sure that their guy can handle things? That's, that's what I'd be, I'd be, I'm, I'm going to be looking at the most. Jason, you mentioned the offensive line. Obviously, State's front seven is very talented. Um, so is it, obviously pride's important, but do you pull more? Do you pull more guard, right guard to the left side? Do you do that? How how like if you if obviously you want them to be physical and play better than they have been, but as far as just from an on paper standpoint, State's front seven is better than UNC's offensive line. So then, do you scheme for that, or do you just say, look, last game of the season, put every put the first eleven behind you and just go play better than the man across from you? Which is how do you go about that? Well, I mean, I think it'd be hard to pull much more than Carolina does. I mean, they run a lot of gap stuff up front. And so, you know, they're going to they're going to pull. I don't know that that gives them a whole lot of advantage. It just means you got to execute and you got to run. You got to run your stuff well. Um, one thing that they can really do to to help themselves is that state secondary has has given up big plays. So, you know, the biggest thing that they can do is early on, if they can get Josh Downs or Antoine Green in particular, if those two guys can find some space and, and get down the field, that can really change things in this game. Uh, you know, the more they're able to, to get some space early in the passing game, the more that they're going to they're gonna have some space to do some of those things in the, uh, in the running game. And so I, I'm, I'm curious to see what they'll scheme up on that front because I think you can scheme up some things against this secondary. Uh, you know, they've, they've lost a couple guys. They're banged up. I think you can score points with the matchups that you've got out wide and in the slot. So to me, you've got to do that, and you've got to make sure that Howell just gets rid of it if it's not there. You know, you're, you're, you're going to take some shots, uh, and you're hoping that your quarterback doesn't take shots. You know, you want him to, him to be the one taking shots downfield rather than uh, them taking shots on him. Yep. So let's, uh, wow. It's 10 o'clock Eastern time. We've been going <laughs> since shortly after eight. What, a, what a show. I mean, I'm just disappointed. I missed the basketball stuff. I mean, that's, uh, that, I know, I know it. there had to have been, that you had missed to have been a epic. fiery Gregory Barnes. I'm going to have Barnes to, was as fiery as we've seen him. I'm going to have like Brady to go Manic back and there. listen to this one. I'm telling you because I, I knew this one would be an epic basketball show and I'm just <laughs> disappointed to miss it. Cause that, I, I, I'm starting to really, you might have a hard time getting rid of me on some of these basketball thing things. I might want to keep joining in. Well, I promise you. Well, I, I would strongly suspect we will be having very similar shows over the next <laughs> few weeks and months watching Carolina basketball. So let's go to predictions, Gregory. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Give me a prediction. You're first up, Carolina State Friday night. I've got first team to forty, winning this game, and I think it's Carolina forty-one thirty-five. Wow. Greg Barnes. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't think that many points are going to be scored. But for some reason, I I don't know if it's the uh, NC State or or what, but with State having all the pressure, um, I just think this is North Carolina's game to win. And uh, I've got Carolina winning this one 28-27. Good Lord. That score has been a thing. Because Carolina was up 27, whatever it was, on Russell Wilson with TJ Yates. And Russell Wilson came back and yep. led them to win 28-27. Jason Staples, are you feeling what the Gregory and Greggs are feeling? I, I am. Uh, and, and I think, I think uh, the, in, you know, the question is whether Sam Howell is going to play, play in this game and whether he's going to be effective if he plays. I mean, that obviously has impact. But watching what I saw from the quarterbacks in this last – in this last game. And obviously it was against Wofford. I think they can win this game with, you know, I, I think they can win this game regardless. Uh, 
do I think that it's better if they have an effective howl? Absolutely. I would hope so. But, um, <laughs> well, actually, no, you hope not, right? You hope that, you know, for next year's sake that they're even better at quarterback. But I just, meant, from, I just meant from your opinion. I hope you believe you think yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. You want no. you want to start the 2022 hype. Let Drake Mayo, Jacoby Chris start the come game in and, and beat NC State on Friday night. Go ahead. Yeah, Chase. that 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 would get the hype train pretty pretty heavy. But <laughs> to me, I, I'm I'm closer to Greg on this. I don't think there's going to be quite as many points scored as as expected. Uh, you know, I got I watched them pretty closely just just a couple weeks ago. What uh, three games ago when they when they played at Florida State, and they struggled to score 28 in that game. And, uh, and that was with Florida state, not being able to move the football with Milton at quarterback at all. Basically. I, I think that this is going to be closer to, to that, you know, high twenties, you know, to mid thirties area in terms of, of score. I think Carolina probably does win this. I, I think the fact that state has depended so much on the, on being able to throw the football and that they have, uh, a less mobile quarterback and big receivers who've been able to uh, to beat up on on smaller corners. I think those matchups actually work out pretty well for a Carolina defense that I think is is turning the corner. Uh, so I, I think this is going to be a game where it's going to be close, but I'm going to favor Carolina to win this one, 34 to 31. Vegas has it 34 to 28 NC State as far as the, the spread and the over under. So pretty spot on there. Well, yeah, flipped, I but I made a prediction in August. I'll stick with it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm riding and dying with those predictions. Uh, You've been great. riding till you die from game one on that uh, on that twelve and zero thing, Tommy. You have to own it. You, you know the world is filled. The streets are filled with squirrels that couldn't make a decision. I made one, and I'm sticking with it. Is that Greg a Clayton Hall, saying? No, man. That's like Aesop's fable or something. Uh, maybe Socrates, I think. Gregory Hall's running the wheels. Greg Barnes has been here. Jason Staples finally decided to get on in here. Uh, it, it has been the longest on the beat live game plan live inside Carolina podcast sponsored by Johnny T-shirt and Johnny T-shirt hmm. come ever. And I hope that the folks that stuck around to the end, it reminds me of the Guns N' Roses concert in Greensboro several years ago, a lot of years ago. Uh, it was uh, three hours long. And we turned around and looked back, and at the end, there was like 30 people left. So <laughs> appreciate it to the people that stuck around um, in this podcast. We'll be back next week at some point. Talk Carolina basketball, Carolina football, maybe a bowl game. Guys, I appreciate it. Johnny T-shirt, they're always our friends. Boys, have a good, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.